Greetings and welcome to our first Open-Minded Skeptic podcast. I am Sharon Ann Rowland, your host. It was three years ago this very day that I contemplated kicking off a podcast series as I needed to manifest a vehicle of sorts to take the voices and messages of my columnists inside the Oddities E-Club magazine further than the rigid publishing forums available back in 2016. I was approached a few days later by metaphysical maven and author, as well as a columnist inside the magazine, Sheila Kennedy, to join her on air at Revolution Radio. I agreed to do it on the spot. We are about to wrap up our final show this coming Thursday evening, and after three years on air and a number of very rewarding encounters and experiences, I am now ready to go solo. I've extracted the highlights from an interview I did on air back in February 2016 to give our listeners, our new listeners, an understanding of not only myself, but also how the Oddities E-Club magazine came about. Do enjoy the discussions that follow between myself and the adorable Sheila. So Sharon Rowland is the author of the Crystal Channelers book series, the editor of the Oddities E-Club magazine, and the Oddities E-Club magazine is an eclectic mix of non-mainstream interviews, articles on ufology, metaphysics, the paranormal, conspiracy theory and fact, fringe science, alchemy and natural healing. And the Oddities E-Club team focused primarily on personal experience and events that have directed their columnists onto a more spiritual and enlightened path, hoping to encourage their readership to stretch their own wings and legs. Um, born in the UK as I was, and you came to Australia in the early 80s, didn't you? Yes, um, it's quite funny. I'm, I'm actually just, just in the last three or four years, I've discovered a lot about the reason why I actually came, or my, my whole family emigrated over here from the UK. And... Mm-hmm. At the time, I just thought it was to give um, my brother and I better opportunities in this country, of course. And um, but it's but in the last few years, um, since I've been um, remembering a lot about my childhood and connecting with childhood friends and family, I've discovered it was um, actually really um, to get me out of England. And because I don't know how to say it. Um, in my childhood, I just I had a series of um, abductions. Oh, my, we were based in Southampton on a military base, and I would go missing, yeah. and the whole base would go out on alert looking for me, and then I would turn back up in my bed um, a few hours later. And this continued while my dad was in the Royal Navy for a number of years. And when I was around 12, um, my parents started to get quite concerned that I might be taken away from them. Okay. And um, so basically, uh, they thought emigrating to Australia would be a good idea. And that's why we came. So, and that's um, interesting, isn't it? (laughs) It's kind of, I'm kind of researching it at the moment to um, having a lot of blocks put in my way to finding out what actually happened on the base because there must have been a lot of witness testimony which I could be collecting. So it's that's kind of my project for this year, or well, two thousand. Fantastic. Mm, so yeah, very, yeah, it's it's quite funny. With um, it's only in the latter years since I've had more experiences, which um, which I don't think you can classify as anything but supernatural, that I've started to learn a lot more about my early childhood experiences. But I think it's pretty much the same for most experiences, to be honest. You, you kind of hide or you bury what, you, what occurred in childhood. The Oddities E-Club magazine mission and reason. It helps sometimes, I think, for people, and this is why I love the E-Oddities magazine, to know that they're not alone. Oh, definitely, and that that really is our mission. It's to help people take, um, like, dip their toes into our world. It's we hopefully we're a soft cushion that you can come yeah. come into the because sometimes people get overwhelmed when they sit down and talk to other 
you know, if they go along to meetings like a UFO research Queensland, they get overwhelmed, they go to one meeting and then they never go back because there's too many people sharing, I think. Whereas some one of the reasons I started the magazine was I wanted people to be start doing their research and start being informed and um, you know, reaching out to other people and our columnists in particular, of course. The magazine's readership And, and it's a way, as you said, of a soft cushion, isn't it? Well, um, I, I think it is. And I, I do, I get a lot of very supportive emails from our readers. Um, more from overseas than in Australia. I like to build up um, the Australian, um, the people in Australia who have actually had abduction experiences. I'd like them yeah. to start communicating with us as, as much as we get from Canada, the US, India and China, surprisingly. So, mm. It's interesting, um, Sharon, because, you know, different times, different shows, I talk about sounds from source and stuff like that, that I've been dealing with for the last 11 years. And if people go to the sounds from source directory, one of the sounds on there, and I can't tell you the number, is called Cosmic Galactic Controls Over Human Subspecies. I've used that. I've used that when I do C5s, Sheila, and we've had some great response. We've had a lot of activity. Abductee statistics and estimates. When we talk about abductions, um, Sharon, I think there are a lot more, aren't there, than people are actually aware of. I, I think, um, as, as, as you know, I do an awful lot of research, and I think I read somewhere a couple of, when I first started researching famous abductions that there's something like 500,000 people have actually um, written reports into MUFON, which is um, over in the States. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you consider how many people are on the planet and 500,000 have actually taken their time to write a report and yeah. consider that probably a good, you know, um, another 1.5 million probably haven't done the report. Um, yeah. Because usually only 25% would actually report on something, in my opinion. Um, that's a lot of people out there. I'd say there's at least 2 million people that have actually had contact on Earth, if not more. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Sounds and frequency. When I've used that, so... It's very good. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of my practitioners have said over the years, why do you have to have all these weird sounds, Sheila? Um, because we need them. It's like programming. You know, I not only created sounds through sounds from source, but also um, with a colleague some years ago, some very powerful stuff with frequencies and so on. And it's like I wouldn't create these sounds if we didn't need them. Um, you know, it's it's that you know even the white noise. Who to contact in Australia if you've been abducted? Because if you've got, from my perspective, and you may have a different way of looking at it, if you've got memories or non-memories, lost time because that, that can be another thing, thing can't it, of people, people losing, losing a few hours and not knowing, knowing what happened in those few hours. hours. And, and you, you, you want, want to find out, out where, where do you go? go? Who do, do you talk, talk to and who do you trust? trust? Well, um, well, if you're in Queensland and New South Wales, um, if, well, if you're in New South Wales, um, then I would suggest you contact Mariana Flynn, who's the president of UFO Research New South Wales. And mm -hmm. if you're in Queensland, I would suggest you contact Cheryl Gottschall, who's the president of UFO Research Queensland. Um, both of these ladies are columnists inside the magazine, and I've known both of them for a number of years now, Cheryl in particular. And yeah. um, they're just amazing women. And I, I think last count, Cheryl has actually spoken with close to 3,500 abductees. She's wow. been researching this since, oh, I don't know, I think she celebrated her 30th anniversary. She's been the president for 
uh, so many years that I don't think people remember when she wasn't the president. And, um, yeah. you know, so I know in Australia, if anyone does want to get in contact or make a reporting, they can contact me and I will pass on to the relevant person um, at the magazine at oddiesyclub.com. Um, I'm happy to pass, up, pass any emails on to the relevant person. Disclosure and Stephen Bass. I interviewed a lovely gentleman. Um, I, oh, I think it was the issue six or issue seven of the magazine, Stephen Bassett, who is a political activist and a leading advocate for ending the 68 year government um, imposed truth embargo on disclosure, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and a few years, a couple of years ago, he, he organized the disclosure conference in Washington. Yep. And uh, there was like five days of testimony of military, um, academia, all on ufology, including the ex, um, one of a, a high, high ranking minister from the Canadian cabinet. Um, so we're talking a lot of people discussing their experiences of um, pretty much hiding the UFO phenomena. Um, now, when I was talking to Stephen about disclosure, you know, we had this debate online about um, how he thinks disclosure will only be disclosure basically when um, the aliens land on the the Washington lawn, basically, and they're <laughs> exposed. And whereas I see disclosure from a very different perspective, um, I think disclosure is um, a one-on-one -on -one experience. I really don't think it's going to be. I mean, if it was the, the well, to be honest, what Stephen was um, talking about actually has already happened in 1952. Um, in 1952, there was, um, I think it was July 19th, 1952, um, a number, like I think several objects were spotted actually above the White House, um, 15 yeah. miles southwest of the city. Um, I mean, it was reported by air traffic controllers and it was, um, so, so that's technically already happened, but no one knows about, still thinks it's a funny concept, don't they? Disclosure. Yeah. 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 But as I was saying, my concept of disclosure is disclosure has been going on for thousands of years and it's on a one on one basis. Um, now, I'm not too clear on what happened to me during my childhood. The only thing from my childhood from a disclosure perspective that I, I actually have is what I call a marker memory. It's, it's like being able to pick up a photograph and see every detail of that photograph. That's what I have from my childhood. I have a photograph of me in discussion with a uh, tall white, which is um, a, an alien, a kind of alien that looks very much like us. But if you can imagine a Swedish runway model, Sheila, that kind of looks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the kind of alien that most humans want to, want to invade because they look like us, basically. And it's um, yeah. so, and that's that's basically where everyone thinks we're hybrids of that that those Palladians or the tall white race. So I yeah, have yeah. that kind of marker memory. The Greer Fund. A couple of years ago, I think it was August 2013, I was um, on Springbrook Mountain. I was part of the what I called the Greer Fund. Dr. Stephen Greer came yes. over and um, on we did two nights on the mountain thanks to the Smurf uh, guys. You know Smurf, Greg Koenig yes. and that. Yeah. yeah, and um, on that night I had my first grey encounter. Well, I believe my first grey encounter, um, and it, that was a good ten-minute encounter where I had telepathic visual contact, and um, so that to me is disclosure. I I had that very special time, and I had telepathic communication. So I've had my disclosure moment. I probably actually had it as a child, but I can't remember everything that happened but um, during the, that time, which I'm trying to do yeah. my research on now, of course. But I think that was my moment of disclosure. The mission. And that 
really got me going on taking the newsletter, which the Oddity Z Club newsletter, and making that into the magazine. That was my Same. push. So I think personally that disclosure happens on a one-to-one -one level. Perception and spot the alien. And even though you, it might happen if you're in a C5 group meditating, there are still times where I've had an experience, but the person on my left and the person on my right hasn't had an experience at all. In fact, they're looking at me like, what? And I'm looking at them like, why can't you see that? Or why? why? You know? <laughs> it's so, it, it's, it's really it's interesting, interesting that, isn't it? it? Um, because, because I've, I've had, had a number of experiences, experiences over the years and documented, documented some of them. And I was thinking the other day, I must find them because they were channeled or downloaded communications from UFOs, uh, one in particular. Um, and um, we, we can talk about that at another time. I thought it might be something interesting for the magazine. But my girlfriend I'm staying with and I are both very good at walking down the street and going, well, I know where you come from. You play spot the alien, do you? Yep. <laughs> Love it. Remote viewing. I, I got on the train yesterday um, to come from the city out to the suburbs on the other side of Melbourne where I'm staying with friends. And um, a couple of stations along, I watched this man walk past the train window and um, come into the, the carriage and he sat a few seats away and on the other side facing back towards me. Um, and there were lots of seats, you know, he could have sat anywhere. And my eyes kept getting drawn to him and I thought, you're staring, Sheila, what are you looking at? You know, look away kind of thing. Um, and he, he looked, um, you know, ethnic, Greek, Macedonian possibly. Um, and he was obviously chewing something, chewing gum, and I don't chew gum, so it always amazes me because I'm allergic to it, that people can eat chewing gum. But there was something kept drawing me back and then all of a sudden it was like his eyes changed and I thought, okay, now I know who you are, thank you. Um, and he got off at the next station. Now, telepathically, it was like he was showing me a box but there was no way of opening the box and it's probably something I need to think about or research down the track. But at the time it was just like you were there for a reason, I'm not sure what it was, and you got off. So, you know, for a lot of people that could be, well, that's coincidence, but for someone like you or I know it's not. It's interesting that he was showing you a box. Um, when I was at Nexus last year, um, I've forgotten the gentleman's name. He was Skyped in from the States. Um, oh, it'll come to me. I've got a shocking memory at the moment. Um, but basically he was saying that when he was a remote viewer, he was remote viewer number one, and where every time he tried to remote view to the moon, he was shown like this this Y symbol and, he, and what it came out was he was being um, blocked and shown a box and that was the corner of the inside of the box. Yeah. yeah. So maybe you're, they, maybe that's just a standard thing they do when people like you and I are too close. It could, it could well be. I, I, um, I'm remote, remote viewing is something, something I laughed about for many years. I did some work some years ago when I lived up in country Victoria, sort of on the Victoria New South Wales border with a guy who was a very, very interesting man and constantly channeling. And he was part of um, watching my back basically while I was doing other things, remote viewing and so on. And he sent me a task one day to um, go and remote view a meeting in the US. And he said there will be 12 people sitting around a table and I want you to describe these people to me. And so it's something I've done over the years, you know, without a great deal of effort, um, probably because it's just been there pretty much all of my life. So I um, went around the table and he went, yes, 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 because he used to be part of this group. And he'd left them and I said, but you're wrong, there's actually 13. And there was another person um, leaning, leaning against, against the wall, the wall. Mm -hmm. and as I was viewing them they were viewing me and we met in the middle Oh, freaky. and I came back with that <laughs> of that. Yeah. it was Joe McMonagall that's the gentleman okay. that was Skyped in and he was known as remote viewer number one um, um, and 
because he was very very good at it and he did it on a daily basis for years and years and years and um yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a kind of a defense mechanism um, because I've also got that. Um, I started when I started doing some research on re remote viewing because in the very first issue, I interviewed a wonderful lady called Leslie Wilkins Hilleman, and she was uh, a remote. She actually was a consultant remote viewer in the States. Okay. And um, she was I, I don't know what the, the correct terminology for it is, but when she remote viewed, she could actually set things on fire on wherever she was remote viewing. Wow. Yeah, so I, I don't know if that's telekinetic remote viewing or it's got another name. But um, when I was chatting to her about her experiences with um, well, basically working for like a government as a contractor over there doing remote viewing, there's some pretty scary stuff that she she was involved in and what they had asked her to do um so not that i can go into it too deeply here no but um no. but yes it's I, I i i'm like you i completely believe i think everybody has the ability to remote view too because i've done a few sessions um with with groups of people and we yeah. put things under boxes and we've all remote viewed and at least 50 percent in the room has guessed what's under the box in or at least sketch yeah. something similar you know so i think yeah. it's something um latent in all of us that we can activate if we want to star seeds in download my perspective um you, you've, you've got, got a whole range of these children, children indigo, indigo, crystal, crystal star, and so on. And, and people, people say, you know, uh, indigos came in in 75 or thereabouts. I believe they've been around since about the 1900s. Well, because if I say I, I'm 66 in March, and I'd say I was an indigo. Well, supposedly there were three waves of, of star children. There's the 60s, the 80s, and the 2000s. And the ones mm -hmm. in the 60s, I was born 68, um... So supposedly we were the messengers, the um, which makes sense for me with the magazine, I suppose, the ones that are yeah. pressing, spreading, uh, you know, laying the path. Um, the eighties um, were the the save the earth kind of children, supposedly the yeah. ones that were, and you do see a lot more vegans, vegetarians, people trying to yeah, yeah in that, that age group, group yeah. protest in that group. And then the 2000s, you supposedly had the change of DNA and these children supposedly have these abilities. They're telepathic, they're telekinetic, they're um, able to communicate interdimensionally and, um, and of course, to extraterrestrially. Is, is that such a word, extraterrestrially? <laughs> well, I like it. <laughs> yeah, sounds good, yeah. Let's, I'll claim that one. Um, so basically that's my understanding of it. But I look, I think... As I said earlier, I think we've been contacted for thousands of years, I mean, however long we've been around, to be honest. Um, especially if you look at some of the artworks that through the ages, it's uh, the early Aboriginal art show is quite distinct in showing ET presences. Um, so quite frankly, I think disclosure and um, and during disclosure, some people are given gifts or they're given insight or they're given. I think people refer to it as downloads of information. I personally think um, I was given a connection to the Akashic Record um, between 2008 and 2011. So mm -hmm. as I wrote my books, because a lot of the stuff in there came, I think, from a channeling source of some type. Um, and I think basically, yeah, we don't always have the gift or whatever. It's given to us for a a particular time or for an activity that we need to complete um, and I think that's the same with these children I think they're given gifts at, at, to do certain jobs I suppose or to help fix certain things I'm hope I try and think positively Sheila that they're here to help the earth and they're here to help us become um, a more peace-loving um, group of people because um, oh, I we certainly yeah. need it <laughs> The change of frequency from 432 hertz to 440 hertz. I just finished reading uh, an old article that was written by Dr. Gemma Regan in one of our early issues about 
the change of frequency back in the 50s. Have you heard yeah. anything about that? I mean, you, I'm surprised if you didn't know about that being the frequency person, how they changed everything. Um, to, um, was it the the note A from 432 to 440? Yes. yes. And what, what, that kind of blew me away after I'd read that article, to be honest. Um, supposedly, um, when we're in the 432 hertz range, maybe you can explain this a little bit clearer than I, um, we we're a more peace-loving type of people. And then when everything got moved to 440, a more of a demonic kind of music range came in. Is, is that true? It, it's, it's actually, actually very interesting, interesting. Um, from a kinesiology point, point of view of your muscle, muscle testing. If you, if you play, play something like a Brahms lullaby, the arm, will, if you're testing the arm using the deltoid muscle, will stay very strong. You introduce something like, for example, country and western, you'll get a little bit of movement in it. Then you go into the more pop sort of sounds and you'll get more movement so there's less hold, the, the body doesn't like that, that particular sound as much. And when, and when you go, go into, into things like, like heavy metal, metal the body, body becomes, becomes incredibly weak. Really? And, and I've, I've actually used, used this um, as a demonstration with students and stuff like, like that. that. Um, and, and I was, <laughs> interestingly, um, the friends I'm staying with, um, Trev's one of my um, practitioners, and I was saying to him just before we were having dinner, um, I can feel myself going downhill, someone's turned my energy off. And, and um, you, you know, know because, because I, I talk about your chakra, chakra system, your meridian system, your auric system, system, or or system, field system, and occasionally, um, if someone's directing a negative thought towards you, it can switch your energies off. And it's literally, literally like someone pulling the plug out of the bath for me. I can feel myself going downhill. So I used it as a teaching um, explanation because I do that a lot with people who work with me and said, do you want to check my energy fields? And, and now I'll show you why we, we fix them and how and, and, and so on. Well, that's all for our first podcast. Thanks for listening. And remember, if you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com. <laughs>